So I'll just start with introductions while we're while people are still starting to come into the waiting room. Um, I'm Jody Davenport. I'm the deputy director of Rail Northwest, and I'll just do a quick uh, round robin and just give our uh, presenters a chance to introduce themselves. Um, Katie. Hi, I'm Katie Drummond, and I am the director of Rail Northwest. And Nicole. Hi, I'm Nicole Patton Terry. I'm the director of Rail Southeast. And Sophie. Oh, you're muted. Hi, my name is E.J. Minton. You can call me Sophie. Um, I'm with Rail Southeast. So we're excited that you're joining us today. Um, so part of our motivation today is basically, how do we make our research matter? Getting knowledge into action. And, and we call this an interactive discussion because we're hoping that you'll all join us and participate in some breakout rooms. But just for a little bit of context, the reason why we pulled this session together is we all have had experiences on um, both the um, NCER and NICSER side of the IES funding program and also on the REL side of the funding program. And we thought it'd be really useful to bring people together to talk about how these two pieces really intersect the different kinds of work we can do as RELs than we could do as individual researchers sometimes. And really just try to be creative about like how can we make our work more impactful and more action oriented. So we're going to start this interactive discussion with a little more of a of a ground, you know, providing some groundwork and framing, and then we'll have some breakout rooms to hopefully make it very interactive. But as we get started, um, Nicole's going to start taking us through um, what is knowledge mobilization and why do we care. Thanks, Jody. So uh, we thought it would be helpful um, to think about how we might ground this conversation. And we think that it's under this very large, broad um, category where you hear this term all the time around knowledge mobilization. It's probably not a term that's new to everyone, though you've probably heard it used to be synonymous with lots of different things like research utilization or engaged research or knowledge diffusion or dissemination or transfer exchange, all of these different terms. Um, so this particular um, understanding or, or its conceptualization of, a, of thinking about knowledge mobilization as a sort of umbrella term actually comes from our, our friends up north in Canada at one of their federal re uh, research funding agencies. It's called the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And they present this notion that knowledge mobilization might be an, an umbrella, be considered as an umbrella term that encompasses a wide range of activities relating to the production and use of research results. Um, they go on to specifically define knowledge mobilization as the reciprocal and complementary flow and uptake of research knowledge between researchers, knowledge brokers, and knowledge users, both within and beyond academia in such a way that it might benefit the users and create positive impacts for society. So some key takeaways from that in the way that we have been doing our work, whether we were sitting on um, the side, the REL side or we're sitting inside of NCER or NC, um, SER, is that there's some three key takeaways I think you might wanna think about when considering how no knowledge mobilization acts in your world. So the first is that there is a right away array of knowledge mobilization activities that are out there that can support production and use of research evidence. Second, knowledge mobilization is a process. It's an active thing and that activity is bi-directional. It's not usually unidirectional. It's usually involving bi-directional engagement with a group. And then finally, that your goals in doing these things and doing these activities are to benefit your end user and to generally benefit society through the use of your research. So it really helps you push forward this notion of research and science as a public good. Next slide. But that's all really lofty and fun and it sounds really good and like it's really easy to do, but there's some very real challenges to actualizing that and making good on that. And in our world and the work that we do in the REL, there are three primary challenges that often we talk about that really make this difficult. The first is just simply how long it takes for evidence from research to reach practice. This particular paper actually is coming from public health field, but the notion is still the same. The idea that moving from priorities from research funding all the way through to funding and then peer review and the syntheses of research all the way to eventually saying, you've got something that you think is evidence-based that can be used in practice to improve outcomes for intended users. That's a journey that can take 
as many as 17 years to get there. And I think all of us feel a certain urgency that that's just not fast enough. How can we make this happen faster? So that's one challenge. The second is talking about research and talking about evidence is hard. This is not a new notion or, con or con concept for our IES uh, PI meeting pre-COVID days. I, I think it was the last um, in-person uh, PI meeting that I attended. There was a whole session talking about communicating scientific evidence from a recent National Academies report. There's this general myth that non-scientists are simply uninformed and that's why they won't do what we researchers say we should do. They don't do use the evidence and do what we think they should do even though we're giving it to them because they just don't know. So we should just, you know, be louder, be clearer, be more present in their spaces and if we, if we were just if we were just better at talking about it, they would then do what we say. But the reality is communicating about research evidence is really complex. Um, it's a really, science is a really nuanced thing. Findings are always evolving and very complex. There are lots of communicators out there in the world that they're hearing from that they need to make decisions about what it is they want to do. And those decisions are not always based upon evidence. They're based upon values and beliefs and who's in their circles and those interactions that are happening there, their own backgrounds and characteristics. And we engage with very diverse stakeholders in our space. And we need to consider that we're trying to communicate about this evidence to our partners. Finally, the third challenge that is very present for us is there are lots of different strategies, different approaches that are available to us to promote evidence use. This is one way I think about it. It comes from Greenline colleagues, but this idea that, that um, these strategies can exist on a continuum from diffusion to dissemination to implementation. Easy way of thinking about this is diffusion is about letting it happen where there's sort of, you put something out there in the world and you hope people use it. It's much more of a passive spread approach. Dissemination is much more about targeted distribution of that evidence. So you are helping it happen. Whereas implementation is much more about making it happen, putting actual supportive strategies in place to help people make use of evidence. In the real world, we do a lot around dissemination and we do a lot around supporting implementation. So these challenges are ever present for us and how it is that we think about knowledge mobilization and in our role within IES. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Jody to talk a little bit more about the REL program in itself and how, how we do that work. Jody. Yeah, so yeah, we're gonna switch things around. Katie, do you wanna introduce like where oh, the REL's are situated and um, in IES and then the REL program? Sure, and I know people hear about the RELs, they know they exist, so this is just sort of an overview of how they're situated with the rest of IES. A lot of us here today are familiar with the left-hand side, the NCR, the NCSER side. IES also has the, of course, the National Center for Education Statistics. And then when you make your way to the right side of our columns here, that's where the regional Education labs are situated with NCEE, along with the What Works Clearinghouse, other contract evaluation studies, and the ERIC Clearinghouse. There are 10 regional education labs, and today we're representing the far northwest and the far southeast, kind of the two spectrums of the country. All the labs work in partnership with districts and state leaders to translate research and apply evidence-based practices. We can also partner with other student or teacher entities like associations and nonprofit organizations. And the RELs have basically three main activities. The first column there, you can see training, coaching, and technical support to use and apply research. We also engage in primary research along with our partners to collect data, analyze data, help them think about ways to use evidence for decision-making and putting better practices into play. And then the third column is all about the dissemination of that evidence. And in all of these areas, we're really focused on capacity building. So we're not doing all of these for our partners, but really with our partners so that they're 
also empowered to kind of continue on the path that we start with them. And Nicole, I believe I'm kicking it back to you. Yes, ma'am. Um, so we thought it would be prudent of us sitting in a room full of researchers to talk a little bit about how the REL program is doing in its efforts, right? So we have this infrastructure set up to tackle these very real challenges for us. We do a lot of uh, self-evaluation, self-reflection, as well as external evaluation to see if our partners are really benefiting from the work that we are doing as we intend, which is a little different than the way that we often do traditional research, but it's a big part of how we make sure that we're making good on this notion of supporting the uptake and use of research evidence. One way we do that is through looking at satisfaction survey data from participants. And what you see here is from a recent evaluation of the program where um, these are responses to survey data that are given to our partners when we ask them about if they have used data or research presented by the role to inform their decision making. And what you see is a very strong response. When partnerships are in place, we do see that our partners make use of the evidence and research that we present to them to make their decisions and inform their decisions. And that's really what we want to see. But we also know that as you started to pull back a little bit from the notion of, of strong partnerships. So when we just put out um, larger surveys where sometimes you have folks who are direct partners with us, sometimes you don't, what you start to see is a little bit of fade of that, right? So this particular survey is, is surveying um, administrators and state education agencies and local education agencies and simply asking them, where do they go to find their research evidence? And what you see here highlighted, hopefully you can see on your screen, the REL is one of many places they go to get, find information, to find research and evidence and use that to make a difference. Sometimes they go to our partners in the comprehensive centers, for example, which is right under the REL program. But you also see they're going to professional organizations, they're going to colleges and universities, they're going to their colleagues in their agencies to find information on, and use research to try to make decisions. On the next slide, you see this is a much more recent um, uh, questioning survey uh, distribution. And this one in particular is to school districts. And we put that there because we know many of you are working, not necessarily at the regional level, but very much so locally in school districts. And when you ask them where they go to find evidence-based strategies and research and make use of this evidence in their settings, what you see is the REL program or the comprehensive centers, what works clearing clouds, those sorts of things are at the bottom of the list. What's at the top of the list are recommendations from their colleagues in other districts. And eventually you also see some of us from colleges and universities they're talking to. Sometimes you see professional organizations. Sometimes you see books and other publications. But again, we have this real challenge where the data, this evidence makes clear that getting what it is that we're doing, pulling this evidence together and presenting in a way that supports outcomes is still challenging to get people to uptake and use it. And so now I think we're gonna give you some examples of how we do that work in our partnerships. Yeah, so again, even though this is interactive discussion, we went back and forth and thought it'd be worth spending a little more time just giving some concrete examples of really what this work looks like when we're trying to get research into practice. So I'm gonna, we're each focusing on one of our partnerships. I'm gonna focus on our Alaska Trauma Engaged Schools Partnership. And so for context, um, you know, it's a, it's a, striking statistic that two thirds of students in Alaska have experienced trauma. And there's many, many um, trauma engaged practices that are really shown to help mitigate these effects of trauma. So we're working with the Department of Education and Early Development in Alaska to really see how can we make sure that these research based evidence based strategies are being picked up. They created a framework that really provides a wonderful um, outline of both all the different kinds of practices at many different levels of the system that can be enacted, but they really want a deeper understanding of how and whether the schools are using these practices and what kinds of create, uh, processes and resources would support the districts and schools to keep using these evidence-based practices and also monitor how it's going and make adjustments. So in the terms of what we could do as a REL, um, so we have the training, coaching, and tactical support. What that looks like in this context is the first thing we did was we really helped them understand what's going on currently. So they distributed this to all over the state. They had online learning. They had in-person learning. They had many, many options for people to learn about these evidence-based strategies, but they weren't really sure about 
what was the actual reach on the ground? So they partnered with us, um, Royal Northwest, to develop and administer a statewide survey. And we got a 60% response rate, which is pretty striking considering this was not just a survey like, you know, one to five, like in your email. It required uh, district leaders to get together with um, different kinds of personnel, including their counselors, um, some support staff, um, and spend about an hour answering pretty lengthy survey questions because they wanted to get a really deep understanding of what does implementing these practices look like on the ground. So not just, oh, check, I do that practice, but really getting a better sense of what does it look like in your setting and how are you doing it? And the goal of doing this um, coaching with them about how to do a good survey that will get the data that they need is this will help them um, identify which parts of the trauma-engaged approach schools are struggling to implement, um, how much um, they are already implementing these strategies, and really figure out what additional supports are needed. A second part of what we're doing with to help them um, you know, basically get these evidence-based um, practices into use is really an applied research project. So looking into what are their different characteristics. Um, Alaska has very, very, very geographically diverse state. It's very large. And there's everywhere from students in the city, like in Anchorage, where there's 100 different languages spoken, um, to really rural remote villages that you have no roads and you can only access a couple times a year. So they really want to look at, for all these different kinds of schools, what are the characteristics of schools that haven't implemented these principles, um, some that are emerging, um, just beginning to implement the trauma-engaged practices, and versus the ones that really have high implementation. They're also interested in the kind of correlations about if people are implementing these well, are, you know, are the outcomes that they would expect for school levels uh, for students or staff working out the way you would anticipate based on the research? And also trying to identify what factors make the implementation either easier or more difficult for schools. And then the final part of what we can do with them is dissemination. So how can we make the uptake easier, as Nicole was saying before? And so some upcoming dissemination strategies include a range of materials, such as videos featuring practitioners reflecting on the successes and lessons learned, um, you kind of one pagers that help people understand what the, you know, how they're doing, what might be the next thing that they can do for the participating schools if they know that they're implementing some places, but there might be some other features of the trauma and gate practice that haven't been fully implemented. Um, and then also blogs and handouts that document the student journeys of their experiences and selected practices. So Nicole's going to talk about one of their partnerships. Thanks so much, Jody. So what's nice is a, a real privilege within the role is that we can do this. We can focus on work that um, is trauma focused, for example, and focus on social emotional issues. And we can focus on work that's more um, traditionally academic focused like emergent literacy. And so here we're, we're are helping the state of South Carolina in partnership with their department. You can go back one slide. There you go. Yeah. With their department of education and specifically the Office of Early Learning and Literacy, we are helping them implement a professional learning community that is focused on emergent literacy. This is an evidence-based professional learning community. Um, and so, and it has lots of parts and pieces as I'll show you, but the goal of the partnership is to really understand the conditions, the facilitators, as well as the barriers that might affect implementation of this particular PLC. Uh, we also wanna know um, outcomes from use of the PLC. Do teachers um, practices change as a result and do children's um, emergent literacy outcomes change as a result? And then we want to know what it would take and help inform the state of South Carolina around scaling up the use of this particular PLC across the state and across different types of early learning um, environments. Next slide, um, and this is only for the purposes of showing that what we're talking about probably doesn't feel very different from many of the things that those of you who are out there working on interventions are doing in your own work. We have four evidence-based recommendations on specific topics that are of instruction um, that should support emergent literacy and young le and learners. We have organized that content into four modules, which will be delivered in up to 12 sessions. Each session we hope to be somewhere between 90 and 60 minutes. Each session has a process within the PLC from debriefing and of uh, what you learned previously to defining new content to um, engage practice and learning and support, then going out there and trying it in their work environment, collaborating with their peers and coming back to reflect and plan for the next time. 
And there are many pieces, right? So what you see are pictures of the guide for facilitators of the PLC and then a handbook for participants in the PLC. So like many other interventions, lots of different components that we hope to put out there in the world that people will use to improve the outcomes they expect to um, improve. Next slide. So in within the auspices of the row, we are focused right now on training, coaching, and technical support for the implementation of this PLC. Right now, we are in seven demonstration sites, which are across the state in two specific counties. And we, the REL Southeast staff, are supporting these demonstration sites in implementing the PLC. So again, this gets to that dissemination implementation. Um, thing that we talked about before, where we are trying to help them make it happen. We are providing intensive coaching for them, which includes the leader. So like the executive director, or if it's a pre-K that's in an elementary school, the principal who will be supporting implementation of the PLC, a facilitator on site who is actually coaching um, their teachers at the site, and then teachers who are participating in the PLC. So what we hope is by going through this entire process, at some point, we should be able to get it over, hand it over and allow for them to try to make it happen. Uh-oh, lost our slides for a little bit. And thank you, Sophie put in our chat, uh, the links to where you can find some of these resources. What we learned from this training, coaching and technical support will inform how the state is going to try to scale up at other sites. Next slide. In addition, we are doing an applied research project around this work where we are going to do a randomized control trial with 100 schools within an embedded mixed meds approach. There will be both quantitative as well as qualitative data collected to help us understand not only teacher outcomes and student outcomes, but also again, what are the conditions under which making use of this type of evidence-based package will actually happen in the real world with uh, in these kinds of environments with our partners. I will say, unlike the project that Jody just presented to us, we have not yet gotten to dissemination as expected, but uh, the results of our applied research and the results of our coaching and training and technical assistance will inform what implementation strategies make the most sense for South Carolina. Thank you. So then the next part we're going to do is we thought it'd be useful to have some breakout groups um, so we could have really engage in the conversation. And then we're going to have two things. One is we're going to start with a jam board. If people, as they're transitioning into breakout groups, want to just put something on there to get us warmed up of, you know, what's something that resonates with you or something you'd like to learn more about from the jam board. If you're, if you've not used jam boards before, just um, you click on, let me just make sure that I'm sharing my whole screen. I'll reshare. I'll share the desktop. Um, you can just click on the little box here. It will add a sticky note for you. And then when you type something, um, it'll just, it will always put it in the same spot. So feel free to just move things out of the way if you see other people moving things. So, um, and feel free to rearrange other people's um, sticky notes as you would like. So what we're gonna spend about, we wanted this to be about half an hour in the breakout rooms. And we're really gonna talk about um, these three different questions. Um, each group breakout room will have a facilitator, but we're really going to expand on once you say what's resonated with you on the Jamboard. Um, what strategies do you use or you're interested in in your work? Some challenges that you've encountered and what are some potential solutions? And so we'll go through each of those. We want to have enough time for a rich discussion and then we'll come back to the big group and see if we could share some takeaways. And the goal of bringing us all together with really different backgrounds is to hopefully come up with some really um, innovative ideas for how we could make our work more meaningful and more in practice. So um, Greg's going to split us up into different um, breakout rooms. So in the meantime, as you're being zoomed away, if you would like to uh, just contribute something that resonates with you to the Jamboard, um, you can do that. And Craig will be putting us into rooms now. Thanks so much, everyone, for sharing your ideas on the Jamboard. Please do continue. And um, Craig, if you haven't already, could you close the breakout rooms? Oh, great, perfect. Welcome back, everybody. Please do share your thoughts on the Jamboard. 
Shout out to Dr. Casey. I see you in the room. It's good to see you. <laughs> this is the teleportation phase of the meeting. We get sucked back to where we go. There's some excellent takeaways on the jam board on, on next steps. It looks like everybody has homework. Nicole, I think we were all automatically muted. Uh, so you're back on mute. Sorry about that. I was going to say on the Jamboard, I see lots of people saying, I want to learn more about, and I know, I'm sure in, in our room, we put links to different resources, um, but those didn't carry back with us to this room. So if there were specific links that were shared in the other room, please feel free to share them in the chat. I'll try to share mine as well. Thank you, Sophie. Yeah, I think if everyone could or put them on a sticky so they'll be on the jam board for everyone. <laughs> we, I believe we will be able to get the chat, but I'm not sure exactly how we'll get it back to you all, <laughs> but you will still have access to this jam board. So Nicole, do you wanna wrap up, talk us through the key, maybe this last part about the group discussion? <laughs> do people prefer to see each other or see the questions? Sure, I can, um, in fact, why don't I put the questions in uh, the chat box and that way we can see each other's lovely faces. We really just wanna hear about some key takeaways from the group on what we researchers can do to amplify and accelerate the uptake and use of evidence-based strategies, as well as other things you might be thinking about um, to support, um, knowledge mobilization. So let me write these questions in the chat. And does anyone want to be brave and ask the first question? Or I should say respond to one of our questions. Um. I saw on the Jamboard how someone talked about getting end users in from the very beginning, and I think that is key um, for uptake. How do we know that we're actually solving a problem that, that our end users have? Excellent insight, Danielle. Thank you so much. That certainly came up in our room. Who who's just asked the a, question? <laughs> sorry, I was just going to add on to that, that in our room, um, we talked about how sometimes you engage the end users in the design and then by the time the funding comes through and you're actually doing it their, their problem has shifted or changed and um we in our group we talked a little bit about how how it's sometimes okay to kind of come back to your program officer at IES and say hey like you know this is how our design process went and now we need to pivot a little bit and sometimes that's something that um can happen so just thinking about how even when you do your best to engage end users from the beginning, sometimes um, if you want to continue to do that, you have to be a little bit flexible in how you're thinking about um, what you're going to do with your project. So this didn't so much come up in um, the discussion that I was just in, which was fabulous, but it is something that my district partners often ask about, which is, um, so I'm a cognitive scientist and most, most of what we know about um, cognitive development is like from upper middle class white populations. And my, my district population, um, the student population is 98% black or Latino. So a question I get all the time is, is this evidence informed practices for our particular um, student groups? And I don't have a good answer for that question because the research is biased in that way. And even the measures that we use, right? Like, I mean, just a lot of them haven't been normed with diverse populations. So I think that's a real issue that I spent a lot of time thinking about and that um, educational researchers need to do a better job of 
thinking about, um, I don't know what we do about the body of research that we have as of now, but we can certainly make movement and progress on the measurement development front, like establishing measurement invariance for different groups. Um, so I think that's, I just wanted to share that to the group that that's a question I get asked a lot. Um, and I can't imagine I'm the only one. So it's an important topic for all of us. Plus one to all of that. <laughs> So in our discussion, and it, I think it jumps from Kristen's discussion, this notion that context really matters with where we do our work. Did you all talk about that in your rooms and, and how that matters to how you're supporting uptake and use of evidence and knowledge mobilization? Ken, I think you maybe if you unmute. Everyone got remuted when they joined this one. So you'd like to speak. I could uh, answer. Um, so one thing that I, we talked about in our group was just meeting the like districts where they are. So some things that I think about when recruiting somebody to participate in our program or um, giving at the end of the school year, like giving them feedback about what we did. It's really about making it more individualized for who I'm presenting for. So at the beginning, if I'm trying to get establish a partnership, it's more of asking questions like, what is it that you're currently working on? And then using the same language that they just gave me back and using that language when I present what it is that I want them to, to buy in on. And then at the end, um, when thinking about how to just share the knowledge that we gained from being in their district and doing this research, we like to do it in a way that is very specific to that district. So for example, we just met with one of our partner districts and we shifted our whole entire presentation to highlight teachers in their district and highlight classrooms that are from their specific program so that they know that we we don't just see our teachers as participants, that we know that they come from different districts, different schools, different levels and backgrounds. So we like to highlight that and acknowledge the fact that at the end of it, you know, this is what all of us came out of, came out with from it. So that's one thing that that I think we should be thinking about is how to individualize what it is that we're presenting and and how we're having these conversations in different contexts. Thanks so much, Casey. That was super insightful and very true. And you bring up an important point that I'm coming. I see on the Jamboard that I'm. It certainly came up in our conversation, so I'm sure it looks like it came up in others. But the importance of engaging with leaders um, in these different spaces that we often are doing work to affect teachers or parents, but often there's a there's another level of decision making there that we might need to attend to in order to support uptake and use of, of evidence. Does anyone wanna share any thoughts or insights about that and where you're thinking about school leaders, district leaders, or others who might be in, in your space for what you want to do? Um, I can share again, just briefly, um, we, for our project, we were looking to work directly with teachers initially um, for them to be in our project. And after um, working to engage teachers in our project for a while, we realized that we needed to also build relationships with the administrators. Um, we were working with small rural districts. And so um, it, it ended up being really important to build those relationships with the administrators, even though we weren't looking to work with them directly. Because when teachers heard about our program through their administrators or through their CESA, like we have these educational organizations in our state through their CESA directors or through their directors of special education, um, they were much more likely to want to participate because it felt like 
something that was sanctioned by their district, something that was like a part of um, something they knew and they they wanted to know more about rather than something coming from somebody or, you know, a university that perhaps they didn't have any connection with. I do want to add to that, um, like on the same note where once the district approves and like they hear it coming from somebody else, um, there could either be like where they're very excited to join because they know it's something that's approved or they feel like they have to. Um, and then it becomes a voluntold teacher rather than a teacher who has volunteered. And from wrapping up this first cohort, I will say that the teachers we had the most challenges with are the teachers that were voluntold. Um, like once at one point we just realized you did not want to do this, you were voluntold and you thought you had to because your district told you about it. Um, so that's something that for this next cohort we're trying to be a little more careful about of having those conversations with our participants on whether they really understand what they're consenting and um, if they really want to be part of a program because that the partnership with that specific school is very rocky right now. Um, but it's so it is two different things. That was a great insight. Thanks for sharing, Casey and Rebecca. Jody, I'm noticing we have one minute left. So do you yeah. want to take us home? No, I just wanted to say thank you so much to my co-leaders of this session. And really, I and I'm my I took tons of notes during my session. So I felt like that was great. That was a great breakout group. So thank you all. And if you could please um please uh, fill out the survey would make the folks at IES really happy. I know they want to make these meetings really productive and they want to know what works so we could always be in that spirit of continuous improvement. But I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you all for taking the time to join us. And hopefully the last uh, few hours of your P virtual PI meeting will be going really well. And uh, we'll stay on for a couple of minutes if anyone else wants to have any other questions, but um, feel free to hop off and uh, get ready for your next sessions. Bye everybody. So thank you to the team. Uh, Good job, how did, your, how did your rooms go? Did, were they were they productive? Oh, I had to go into total professor mode. I was like, you must turn on your screens. I'm <laughs> going to call on you. Yeah, but it got but they eventually got going. But I did have to do a lot of sort of facilitating. <laughs> I made discussion. everyone introduce themselves because there were only ten people, and I think that got them all to. The, you know, we're all here together. <laughs> and I, but I do think that it was nice. It was kind of a good size. I thought it ended up being because it wasn't too many people where it took forever. But, um, but once some people got a role, then they started raising their hands. It's like, okay, yeah, let's go. Let's keep going. Yeah. yeah. Was your well, I'm with you. I started being like, don't mean to put you on the spot, but. <laughs> <laughs> All in the future, of course, but like. <laughs> but it worked out. Real, I will say, in my session, I had a couple of IES people, so I had a couple of Nixer people and RAL people. So I, I was like, "You talk about what we do now. You talk about yeah. it." So that was kind of nice. I was like, "Chris, why don't you tell them what you think about?" <laughs> so I actually think that kind of helped. So Jody, I think you're you're. You were always very clear that we needed to explain the RAL program to people, and I think that mattered. So that was kudos to you. I think that really mattered um, to, to framing the discussion well. It mattered in our session for sure. Yeah, well, I appreciate your adding those extra slides at the beginning too, because I think that, you know, having been to more of these sessions, I think you're right. I think because like the researcher mode is like, you want to be interactive, but then also like, just tell me some stuff. So I could just like, like <laughs> just tell me some things, pour some information in my brain. Yeah. <laughs> I think it ended up being kind of a nice balance where I think people felt like they had the chance to talk. The breakout room didn't feel rushed, but then mm -hmm. it also felt like there was a, there was an it. Cause the, the I don't know, Sophie, you went there, you went to the first one today. I, they seem like they got thrown into breakout rooms pretty early. And I know um, mm -hmm. at least that's when I jumped out. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, ah, I'm not ready to talk yet. <laughs> we, like, we couldn't even get into like having a full conversation. And the breakout room they set up was like pretty short. Mm -hmm. So, um, but like, because like people have this expectation, like it's going to be very short, like in limited time. So everyone talks really fast. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah.
But I, yeah. I think it's a good uh, contrast between our session and theirs because there's more a uh, think about um, individual members mm -hmm. efforts in this and challenge in this. So they talk uh, a lot about um, having a, a, a marketing background experts to help them. And mm -hmm. they talk a lot about uh, uh, working with publisher um in terms of the dissemination which is more like uh I, in my head is more like a uh, more a traditional kind of a thinking about mass production um yes our work is like we work with actual living individual uh, to build a relationship which is very different so yeah yeah i it's totally different. agree yeah ours had some really cool nuggets like you know just like the talking about meeting with people but telling them i could meet with you any time of day any way we could text we could call we could mm -hmm. zoom and just understanding like i don't care if it's like 10 o'clock at night like let me know what works for you for 10 minutes yeah. and just understanding their life and then one actually it was your former student uh, nicole casey <laughs> was saying that one of the things they did was actually creating testimonials from the teachers that were doing mm -hmm. the interventions at the end and then sharing them i was like oh that's really that could be a scalable yeah it's, it's both making people feel seen and it's showing people it, it came up in our group like the obviously different evidence like a research paper is evidence to a researcher but to uh sometimes district people like they want to see it in action like a video yes. of their teacher saying it's good is more evidence to them that it's worth investing in than your research paper and yes. so um i thought it absolutely was like, yeah yeah, yeah. This is a perfect example of what you gave the talk you gave yesterday, Nicole. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Someone in our asked, um, "What evidence do you, people use? Like, do you, uh, uh, educators? What is the evidence that they need? How rigorous does the evidence need to be?" And I was like, "They want their test scores. They right. want to show that you are moving their test scores." There's like, they don't want an RCT that doesn't know. Mm -hmm. They don't. So they're still there's there's. I think I, I, what I most appreciate most about our session, I think is I think we just sort of illuminated some things that I think sometimes we take for granted mm -hmm. in the real world. Like I would never think anybody, an educator wants an RCT, but, but they, but the, but the other side well, of the room, turns that's out the lens. Turns out people that are here don't understand that. <laughs> yeah, but the, for the other side of the room, that very much so is a lens, but that's also because that's what they get funded to do. So mm -hmm. they, that's yeah. why it matters to them. So it's, it was nice to see so many IES people in there and maybe, Maybe we're seeing a sea change. It came up in our group about like sharing preliminary findings and letting mm -hmm. the participants like co-interpret and make sense of like, here's some other things we'd like to see in the data. Mm -hmm. And I like want IES to hear that because like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's not always like wait for the peer review and the peer review and the peer review and the sanction like stamp, you know, people want that information sooner and then they want to have influence over what's being studied. Yeah. I don't know who put this sticky notes in the in the board, uh, but one person said I would like IES to provide additional funding to evaluate the health of the RPPs using the framework put out by one of the rails. Mm -hmm. It's happening already. <laughs> yeah, or at least we're ahead of the game there. <laughs> Alrighty, guys. Well, thank you all. This was yeah, really great. It's the highlight of the meeting for me. It was working Absolutely. with you all. So. It was wonderful. It came together. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you for the scrappiness. Thanks for the the, the IES uh, format of the. Hey, <laughs> I, it all it was worked like out. what I'd originally started. <laughs> was, I'm like, you know, you're right. So hopefully, but, I didn't mess anything up too much when I transferred it over. I think I might have got a year wrong. One of those it was beautiful was like, and perfectly executed, just like every wedding. Nobody sees the sausage; they just see exactly. the happy bride and groom. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, good to see, see you, Sam. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.